Good afternoon. I'm Martin Filbert, and as Provost and Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs, I am pleased to officially open this program. I invite you to join in singing of the Star Spangled Banner and ask those who are able to please stand for the singing of the National Anthem. Commencement ceremonies for most of the university's schools and colleges were held at the end of the winter term. The curricula of some of them extend beyond that date. It is the custom of these schools to convene their ceremonies at a later date. It is a privilege to convene the graduation ceremony for the 169th class of the University of Michigan Medical School. Congratulations. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Marshall Runge, Executive Vice President for Medical Affairs, Dean of the Medical School, and CEO of Michigan Medicine. He will introduce the honored guests in attendance today. Thank you, Martin. And welcome everyone to today's commencement ceremony. I'd like to introduce a few of our leaders who have chosen to join us today. Our honored speaker, Dr. Abdul El Sayed, our provost, Martin Filbert, our vice provost for academic and faculty affairs, Dr. Lori Pierce, president of the Michigan Medical <coughs> Medicine Alumni Society, Dr. Juan Carlos Alejos. And I'd also like to acknowledge all of the families, spouses, significant others, and friends who have provided their support. Your compassion, your understanding, your knowledge, and yes, uh, as hard as it may be to admit at the time, even some of your advice have sustained this class and all of us. Let's give a hand to our, uh, all of these. And now to our 2019 medical school graduates. Today, you officially enter the profession of medicine and the family of Michigan alumni. This is one of those great days you'll remember for the rest of your life. For those of you who are not familiar with this class, let me share a few facts. In August 2015, 170 students began their journey here as first year students. Today we graduate 164 graduates. Uh, some of the peers in this class started in earlier years or took time off for family or to pursue research or other opportunities and within this graduating class, 31 of you are receiving a second degree. Five have earned, earned PhDs through our medical science training pro program, and the remainder have earned master's degrees in public health, business, and clinical research. But it wasn't all work and no play. In addition to their many academic achievements, 17 students got engaged. This includes three couples who met while here in medical school. 10 students got married during their time here, and 10 babies were born to our 2019 graduates. Yeah. 
And one couple who met here, got engaged, married, and had a baby. I don't know if that's a trifecta, but it's something like that. When you started your journey four years ago or longer for some of you, it probably felt like graduation was a lifetime away. But today, you begin the next phase of your career. And, much as, and as much as you've learned in the last four years, during your residencies, you'll probably learn more, in fact, much more. You'll gain a new appreciation for what it really means to be the decision maker in precarious clinical situations. Perhaps most important in all, of all, you'll learn how important your relationship is with your patients, to your patients and to you. It's these relationships that will stay, sustain you through the difficult times. They'll bring joy and they'll bring sadness. They'll be a constant reminder that life is precious and balancing your work and your life not only makes you a better physician, uh, but a better person. Your futures are bright and your next phase of training is one you'll never forget. You'll learn, you'll learn a lot, you'll have experiences you never forget, and you'll develop friendships that will last a lifetime. So how are you gonna achieve these lofty, lofty goals? Well first, remember there's always you can learn more and do more for your patients, and you'll probably learn more from them than you learn from anybody else. Alan Alda, who famously portrayed the surgeon Hawkeye Pierce in the television series MASH, spoke at Columbia's medical school graduation, and his words from 40 years ago ring just as true today. Possess your skills, but don't be possessed by them. You've developed an enviable skill set. Second, never forget that you have a responsibility to use your schools, your skills, to the benefit of health and the health of society. So how might you do that? Well, you'll do it in many ways. But a commonality among all of you, all of your class, is your ability to lead. And now, more than ever, medicine needs leaders. Third, never stop learning. Learning is interesting, it's rewarding, it's fun. It can be a little work. Uh, the pace of new knowledge and understanding, though, is accelerating at a rate as never before and will only grow during your careers. Roger Cornbread, corn, corn, excuse me. <laughs> let's, let's delete that part. Roger Cornberg, uh, a Nobelist from Stanford, often comments something along the lines of, we can only grasp a tiny fraction of 1% of what there is to know and understand. And there's no way that you can be an effective physician by just knowing everything. You'll leverage technology today in a way that nobody of my generation had the opportunity to do at your stage of your career. To fill your quest for knowledge, you'll need to bring new, bring new technologies, assess new technologies, and adopt them based on the answer to a simple question, will this technology advance health? But the good news is you're not going to be on your own. More so today than ever, innovation in healthcare will bring others from many different disciplines to work together. Nurses, pharmacists, physical therapies, engineers, social workers, policy makers, data analysts, to name a few, will be working with you to improve health and improve the health of your patients. Let me just close by saying what's been true for all of us, and in particular for all those you admire most in medicine. Medicine is rewarding. Medicine is challenging, but when you keep the health of your patients and yourselves first, there'll be much more joy than heartache. I look forward to leading you in the Hippocratic Oath and congratulating you, each of you as you receive your, your diploma. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Carol Bradford, Executive Vice Dean for Academic Affairs and Chief Academic Officer for Michigan Medicine, who will guide us through the rest of the ceremony. Thank you so much, Dean Rungi. Good afternoon, and first and foremost, congratulations to our class of 2019. Before we proceed, I would like to extend a special welcome and thank you to all of our scholarship donors who have joined us to get today. We are so very grateful for your generous support, which has helped make this day possible for so many of our graduates. Thank you for your commitment to medical education and your investment in the future of medicine. Thank you. <laughs> to our graduates, enjoy this day 
This is truly one of the biggest days of your entire life. While today you are becoming a doctor, uh, you still have a far journey to go, uh, and your journey is really just beginning. Wherever your career takes you, um, I'd like to give you a piece of advice. Pursue your dreams and pursue your passions. With each patient you treat, each student you teach, and each discovery you make, you are really charting your legacy. Be confident and be bold because you are fully equipped to make a difference wherever you go. As you begin this next step in your journey, my next piece of advice, please take care of yourself. I know your first instinct, instinct will be to do everything within your power to help others. But you must also be well in order to give your best to your patients, learners, families, and science. You will face fatigue and frustration. We all do. When you do, press the pause button and refresh yourself. You and the community you will serve will benefit. I liken this advice to the tried and true advice we've all heard when we are getting ready to fly on an airplane. Put your own oxygen mask on before helping others. Heal thyself first. And I really do hope the class uh, remembers that. As you begin residency this summer, it's a scary time. You're going to learn a lot of new things. Um, and you're going to uh, bear the MD symbol, and really the buck will stop with you. Remember that being a physician is truly a sacred privilege and a calling. Um, always honor the Hippocratic Oath, and first and foremost, do no harm. We will recite the rest together later. And candidly, it's always been one of my favorite parts of today's very meaningful ceremony. Finally, remember as you go that we are so extremely and amazingly proud of each and every one of you. We know that you will all do great and amazing things. Carry the University of Michigan flag, the maize and blue proudly wherever you go, and show the world that our medical school graduates are leading the future of healthcare. Better yet, plant that flag firmly wherever you go. The block M will always be with you, and so will we. Congratulations. It is now my sincere honor and pleasure to introduce Wala Tout, who has been selected by all of you to speak on behalf of the senior class. Wala has an incredible background. She earned her bachelor's degree in biology and psychology from the University of Michigan, Dearborn. In 2014, she was recognized as one of the prestigious Chancellor's Medallion recipients, an honor given to graduating students selected by the faculty based upon academic record, quality of character, vitality, intellect, and integrity. While in medical school, Wala joined the Global Health and Disparities Path of Excellence and worked with a local health department to improve their language services. She served as president of the Muslim Medicine Medical Students Association and was involved in a variety of student groups. She pursued her interests in narrative medicine by creating a podcast series about the medical school experience. In 2018, Walla was inducted into our Gold Humanism Honor Society. Alongside these accomplishments, Walla is proud to say 
that she has accumulated a robust resume of rejections. During her time here, she has published nothing, not even a case study. Voila will enter her residency in family medicine at the University of Chicago Medical Center. Please join me in welcoming Voila, the 2019 class speaker, as she gives her address entitled, The Leaders and Substantially Improved. Thank you, Dr. Bradford, for that slightly embellished <laughs> introduction. <laughs> Welcome, family and friends, faculty and staff, fellow doctors, <laughs> almost. Um, an attending who was not seated behind me today once wrote that I should learn how to use words better. So I'm confused, um, but also honored and very grateful to be here today. First, I want to acknowledge all our loved ones who made it possible for us to be here today. From day one, you all trusted us with your deeply personal medical questions that we were not prepared to answer. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why your rush is doing that. I've spent the last two weeks drawing amino acids. That came in really handy. <laughs> but you all here, you were the first people to believe in us. And you reminded us of who we were when we forgot. And we couldn't have done this without you. So thank you. So what was medical school like? It was magical. Next question. <laughs> it's impossible to speak to everyone's story. But we all went through the same major chapters. We started getting off to know all the characters. Imagine all the most neurotic overachievers from your high school in one place. <laughs> when I started here, everyone was high key about everything all the time, and it was amazing. I was so inspired. Like, I expected you guys to be talented, but you were so generous with that talent. You gave 100% of yourself to your community, to your research, to your student groups, to your friends, to you know, tag days, a smoker, I am sports, the list goes on and on. You all care so deeply, you are so driven, and you own a truly staggering number of tearaway pants. <laughs> it's infinite supply. <laughs> um, but I've been so inspired the whole time that I've been here. We shared flashcards, we shared study playlists together, and we approached every challenge with patience and dignity, except that time that the course registration server crashed and we totally lost it. <laughs> um, speaking of disgruntled students, will the real Curry Cullum please stand? <laughs> Worth a shot. <laughs> what was medical school like? Mostly it was standing around smarter people and nodding vigorously. Yeah, IL-33, that was my first thought as well. When we started on the wards, we were no less talented, but it's kind of the role of medical students to be the least competent person in every room, and that was a little bit hard for us. We've all made eye contact with a surgeon during grounds when you're two minutes into your patient presentation and you're still talking. <laughs> but we also received glowing feedback from people we respected, like read more. <laughs> We'd like to, but that's all they ever wrote. <laughs> Training here meant that we learned from people at the top of their field, people who are always trying to get better. And being at a research institution like Michigan meant that we had every opportunity available to us. And we took a lot of surveys every day. 
If you can dream it, someone at Michigan has probably already drafted the IRB proposal. <laughs> so what was medical school like? It was an incredible experience that I would not want to repeat. <laughs> we all walked in here at White Coat Ceremony to this jubilant music that played for us again here at the final chapter of our triumphant journey of medical school. But there were times when my story here felt more like one of decay instead of growth. And I'm sure that some of you also felt at times the erosion of joy and purpose. For me, um, in my M2 year, I really struggled because all the easy things suddenly felt impossible. Like this day felt way out of reach. And I share that with you because I want you to know that I've personally tested my only piece of practical advice for you today. Uh, go to therapy. <laughs> <laughs> The psychiatry prescribed for others actually works, and uh, you deserve the same quality of life you're gonna work so hard to ensure for others. But I hope that most days you find the joy among the grief and stress and blah of medicine. We all came in here at White Coat and we sat right over there, and we were so excited to join this noble profession where we were gonna save lives and change people. And then we saw behind the glossy mirage of the hospital, we saw the team room dungeons and the endless call schedules, the button clicking, the bowel regimens, <laughs> a lot of those. And sometimes maybe that was a little bit disheartening. But to quote Terry Pratchett, just because we learn how something works doesn't mean it stops being magic. And the people who opened up to us and shared their vulnerabilities with us, the people who trusted us to contribute to their care, even though we couldn't order Tylenol. That was the real thing. I mean, you all came in here, and I'm sure you wrote different fancy personal statements, but, you know, in working with you, I think what it boils down to is that all of you are the kind of people who you see somebody hurting and you want to help. And even though we didn't directly, independently treat during our time here, I really believe that we helped to heal people. And if we can hold on to that, I think we can find the joy amid all the chaos that's coming our way. <laughs> Graduation is an incredible accomplishment. We all worked so hard to get here, and I'm so proud of us. <laughs> Learning from you and growing alongside all of you, that's been one of the greatest privileges of my life. So class of 2019, the leaders, and yes, the best, <laughs> congratulations and go blue. Thank you, voila, for that wonderful and inspirational and really honest, candid address. Thank you. Uh, next, it is my sincere pleasure to welcome uh, this year's commencement speaker, Dr. Abdul El Sayed. Dr. El Sayed is a physician, epidemiologi epidemiologist, public health expert, and a 2018 Michigan uh, guber gubernatorial candidate. He completed his undergraduate work in 2007 at the University of Michigan, graduating with highest distinction and Phi Beta Kappa, also while serving as a starting defenseman on the men's lacrosse team. 
pretty cool. He holds a doctorate in public health from Oxford University, where he was a Rhodes Scholar, as well as an MD degree from Columbia University. Dr. El Sayed was a tenure track faculty member at Columbia University's Department of Epidemiolo Epidemiology. He also served as health commissioner in Detroit. Under his direction, the department became a national leader in public health innovation. In 2016, the Michigan League of Voters recognized uh, Dr. El Sayed as public official of the year. Please join me in welcoming Dr. El Sayed. Thank you. Dean Bradford, thank you for that lovely introduction. Provost Philbert, graduates, graduates, parents, family, friends, I am so deeply honored to be invited here to, to share this moment with you today. When Dean Mangrulkar invited me, uh, he asked if I'd like to know what it was like to graduate from a real medical school. <laughs> thank you for, for having me. To be honest, though, I'm actually often asked if I'm even a real doctor. That's up for debate, I guess. When I ran for governor, an enterprising journalist wrote an article. El Sayed touts his doctor credentials, but he never practiced medicine. And it's true. I've never practiced medicine. That wasn't always the plan, though. After all, I don't think anyone plans to memorize thousands of PowerPoint slides, listen to hundreds of lectures at three times speed, or show up to pre-round pre at 5 a.m. because they don't intend to practice medicine. <laughs> like I'm sure many of you graduating here today, I always wanted to be a doctor. I love science, the exactitude of the thing, the fact that every question has an answer even if you don't yet know it. The fact that through rigorous research, we can discover it. And I love people. There's nothing more interesting than fellow humans, from the grand scale of the social organizations that we build to the little nuances that make us the unique individuals that all of us are. Medicine, I thought, was the juxtaposition of the two, social work meets physiological engineering. But more than that, I've always believed deeply in the profound power of a doctor, that incredible power to heal. I believe it was handed to me by my, mater my paternal grandmother, my teta Soad, a woman who lived her life half a world away in Alexandria, where my parents immigrated from. That's Alexandria, Egypt, not Virginia. <laughs> my teta was the wisest, most intelligent person you have ever met. And she never got to go to school, never stepped a day into an institution like this one. Raised her six kids in a one-bedroom apartment overlooking a fish market where my grandfather, who had an eighth grade education, sold vegetables. She raised six kids, but gave birth to eight. Two of them died before their first birthdays. As a working class family in 1950s and 60s Alexandria, they didn't have easy access to a doctor. But by dint of happenstance, when some of her other children got sick, they got the medical care they needed. They got to see a doctor, and they lived. So to this woman with no formal education, doctors, you perform miracles. Doctors were the hope of people like her, the downtrodden, the marginalized, the illiterate. That's why she always, always wanted my dad, her oldest son, to be a physician. But a slight problem got in the way. My dad hates the sight of blood. So he went on to be a different kind of doctor. He earned a PhD in engineering. Gears don't have blood. And that means that the uh, not being a real doctor thing runs in the family. Just don't tell my dad. I wanted to be the doctor that my teta wanted me to be, the doctor who saved the aunts and uncles that I'd gotten to meet, the one I wish had been there to save the ones I never got to know. And as I pursued my training, I, just, I saw just how impactful a doctor can be, how much good we can do, how a clinical insight can fundamentally change the life of someone who's been suffering in pain, giving them an explanation for their symptoms, let alone the potential for a cure. And I watched as the simple act of listening to someone in pain, bearing witness to their struggle, heals a spirit beyond a body. There's also something 
special about knowing that you were occupying the space that generations of healers had occupied before you. Surely, medicine's changed since the times of Galen or Avicenna or Hippocrates. A lot more PowerPoint. I think if Hippocrates had to deal with the EMR, he'd probably picked a different profession. Or he'd have just changed the oath. It would have been, first, do no harm unless it's breaking the damn computer. <laughs> Modern science, it's allowed us to do things today that seem mundane for us, but even a few generations of back would have been miraculous. We can get a perfect image of the inside of somebody's body without opening it up. Can coax cells to grow and trick cells that are overgrowing to stop. Can take a heart out of one body and put it into another without skipping a beat. People survive not just one cancer these days, but many. A heart attack or a stroke, no longer a death sentence. Vaccines and antibiotics have made death of children a rare occasion. That, of course, is when people decide to use them. But even the anti-vaxxer thing reminds us something. At its core, medicine it remains a human exercise, founded on a willingness to listen and to care and on the trust that we build with our patients, that we have the best interests at heart. And when we lose that trust, bad things happen. Oh, we bring a vastly different set of tools to the bedside today. We still work at a bedside, the bedside of another human who is ill. That human aspect of medicine, that's what connects us to every doctor who has ever practiced before us, every doctor who's ever sat by a bedside. We're willing to listen to people in pain and work to heal them. We dignify those humans' lives. At best, we inherit their empathy. That's what my grandmother saw in her children's doctors. That's the kind of doctor she wanted me to be. It's the kind of doctor I wanted to be. It's the doctor that all of you will be. But somewhere, it seems like we've forgotten that. We lost it. Today, we have the ability to cure cancer, transplant a heart, but we seem to have forgotten that beyond the patient, beyond the diagnosis, lives a person in pain. As I trained, I watched the consequences of treating people like patients. Or worse, like walking parts of your profit margin. I watched a palliative care doc get pushed out of a hospital because she was convincing too many patients to get appropriate end-of-life care. But because the hospital just built a new ICU, they were losing money. I was learning that to survive in this system, you shouldn't care for the person, just the patient. I struggled with my decision to even apply for residency. I mean, I loved patient care, because I loved science and I loved people. But I didn't believe in the system in which I would be asked to provide it. In the end, I got a lot of advice, a lot of deliberation conversations with my loved ones, and I decided to apply for a residency in internal medicine. And I thought that was that. And then I got to meet a woman named Ms. G who altered the course of my career. She'd fallen that morning and she'd hit her head on the subway steps. She'd been drunk, a victim among countless of alcoholism. I'd come to learn a lot more about her beyond her case. I learned that she loved singing. She had this beautiful baritone voice. She really wanted to be a nurse. And I learned that she dropped out of middle school. She'd been abused by her mother's boyfriend. She was a black woman in a society that criminalizes race, a poor woman in a society that treats poverty like a moral failure. And she wound up in a medical system that seemed to have forgotten its purpose. Now, I was the sub-I on that rotation, and I was responsible for liaising between the emergency department and my floor attending. I had been paged to clear her for discharge, and when I checked with the ED resident in charge that day, I asked what her head CT had shown. We didn't do one, he said. She barely hit her head. I could clearly see the abrasion on her head. You and I know that if any of us had fallen, hit our head, we'd wind up getting an emergency CT, the standard of care. She barely even got a history in physical. My attending and I, after a conversation, decided that we were going to admit her. And Ms. G, she, she became a personal referendum on my career in clinical medicine. After all, she was the kind of patient that I got into medicine to take care of the kind of patient my grandmother believed that doctors existed to serve. We took care of her for two weeks, 
diagnosed her with full-blown AIDS, had a paradoxical hypotension because the HIV virus had infested her adrenal glands. They had a pelvic mass that had been bleeding for months, all issues that were missed in that ED. Over the course of the two weeks she spent on our service, I personally bird-dogged her discharge. Found the only rehab facility that would accept HIV-positive patients, and then worked with their housing administration to secure her housing for people with HIV. And on the day of discharge, we went through the plan yet again. One more time, I thought, we just got to get it right. And that's when she said, I'm not going there. I'm sorry, what? I'm going home with my daughter. I didn't even know she had a daughter. Turns out that they'd lost contact a few more years back when Ms. G had started drinking again. Ms. G, listen, I hear you, I said. But, but don't you think it, it, it might be better to just, you know, get your housing established and then you can go and reach out to your doc, daughter? She said, don't tell me what to do. You're not better than me. And she was right. We're not. She went home with her daughter that day and I thought about that case for weeks. What did I do wrong? What could I have done better? And I resolved that what I had learned on that case, that I was going to apply it every single day of my training from here on out. I never wanted to be like that emergency room doc who wanted to discharge her prematurely, who saw in her what he called a social admit. I thought that that was the last that I'd see of Ms. G. And about two weeks later, I'm getting on the subway to go and have dinner with a friend. I step onto the car, and I see a woman laid out on the seats, and she turned her face, and it was Miss G. I got home that night, and I pulled my residency application. I wasn't going to practice medicine after all. I think a lot about that decision, if I made the right one. I mean, the jury's still out. I'm unemployed, and I spent the last two years asking people for money, so... And though I may not heal people on a daily basis, I hope that the work that I can do is about healing a system that tells us that people like Ms. G aren't people enough to be listened to, to be healed. If the health system itself needs doctoring, that is the bedside that I hope all of us are willing to listen and heal at. You, you're not going to face questions about whether or not you're real doctors. I mean, you're here to earn an MD, that's what an MD means, medical doctor. I thought the same thing, by the way. To your patients, it means that you can be trusted to listen, be trusted to heal. But only you can decide what that MD means to you. Our system will tell you that the person behind the patient is secondary, that you need to move faster, care less, protect your feelings or they'll get hurt. But don't forget the doctor you wanted to be. Dr. Mike Teta would want you to be. That doctor, after all, performs miracles. You share that gift with every doctor who's ever sat by that bedside beside you. The ability to listen to a person in pain, to heal them, to dignify that human life. Be that doctor. But that's not even enough. These times, they call for something far bigger. It's not enough to simply listen to people in pain when they are the victims of a system of power that does not always serve them. Doctors today is not enough just to listen. We've got to take on more roles. Beyond listening to people in pain to heal them, we have to be willing to speak truth to the power that makes them sick in the first place. Too many times, we choose silence. We empower that system against us and the next person who might dare to stand up and say something. We do that because often we're more concerned with who we might have to stand up to. But remember, when you take that oath today, remember the commitment you're making and to whom you're making that commitment. It's about the people you are serving. So I'm asking you today, be less concerned with who you have to stand up to, be a lot more concerned about who you're standing up for. You owe your patients your ears, your skills, yes. You also owe them your voice. So I don't practice medicine day to day, but I still believe in the magnificent power, the magic that doctors have. And we need you to believe in it too. People like my teta, like Ms. G, they're relying on you to believe in it. 
From here on out, people are going to call you doctor. To them, it means they can trust you in the hardest moments of their lives to listen to them, to dignify them, to heal them. But what will that mean to you? Doctors, welcome to the profession. I know, we know, that you will listen. We know that you will heal and that you will speak. And we need you now more than ever. For today, congratulations. For tomorrow, good luck. And forever, go blue. Dr. El Sayed, thank you for that inspirational address. And here is a small token of our appreciation from the University of Michigan. Now it's time to present the award recipients for the class of 2019. I would now like to introduce Dr. Joseph Kolars, Senior Associate Dean for Education and Global Initiatives who will present the awards. Thank you, Dean Bradford. The achievement of excellence is the individual obligation of every student and practitioner of medicine. To those who have in their careers evidence particular dedication to fulfilling this responsibility, recognition is given through the awards which I now have the pleasure of presenting. Let me start with the Senior Award. It's my pleasure to announce that the class of 2019 has elected Dr. Dan Cronin as the recipient of the Senior Award. Dr. Cronin, please come forward. The senior award goes to the member of the faculty of the medical school who in the view of the graduating class best exemplifies the ideals of the teacher clinician. So it is appropriate that the recipient of this award is selected by the graduating class. The award consists of a certificate signed by the president of the student council. She will also have her name, he will also have his name added to the plaque along with all the names of past year's recipients. The plaque hangs in the Office of Medical Student Education. Congratulations, uh, Dr. Cronin. Wow. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. I'm touched. That is quite the honor. Thank you. Class of 2019, you are incredible. Let's have one more round of applause for our class. It is with such joy that I stand here with you today to celebrate you and to celebrate your loved ones who have supported you through perhaps the most rigorous moments of your lives. Let's give another round of applause for your loved ones too. Now, I've learned many lessons from you over the past several years, and the most impactful of which is the power of vulnerability. And with that being said, I want to take a moment with you today to be vulnerable, to share with you a deeply personal story I've never told before, with the hope that you can benefit. During my fourth year of medical school, my best friend's dad was nearing the end stages of a devastating neurodegenerative disorder of unknown etiology. He had seen multiple specialists across the country, had undergone multiple diagnostic tests, including brain biopsy, and had trialed various empiric treatments. Despite that, his condition was worsening. One day in my M4 year, while I was at their house visiting, I heard a quiet, sorrowful whisper from the stairwell. Dan, can you come over here, please? As I looked over, I saw my best friend's mom with a apprehensive and yet deeply soulful look on her face. She said, I think he's passed. Would you please mind coming to check? 
As I paused, thoughts raced through my head. She said, it may take a while for the hospice nurse to get here. Would that be okay with you to check? Holding back tears, I hugged her, took a deep breath, and I began to walk up those same stairs, which I so often ran down as a child, laughing and smiling with my best friend. This time, as I reached the top of the stairs and I walked into the room where he was, multiple family members greeted me. One of them handed me a flashlight and said, I'm not sure if you need this, but I've seen it on Sherlock. <laughs> and so I gratefully accepted the light and I began to examine my best friend's dad, my hands shaking. And as I examined him, I couldn't help but remember the happy moments from our childhood of boating, camping, and playing sports. And I also couldn't help but realize the objectivity of my examination. His pupils were fixed and dilated. He had no heart sounds, no central pulse, and he was not breathing. My best friend's father was dead. And so I looked around at that family in the room and I said, with tears in my eyes, I'm sorry. I am so, so sorry. He's passed away. Never did I think that my first solo death examination would be performed on someone that I cared so deeply about. Never did I think that my first time delivering the news of a patient's death would be to my best friend's family, my family. In your residency, you are going to have hardships. It is inevitable. And you're going to experience heart-wrenching moments. This too is inevitable. And you know what? That's okay. Because these moments are what remind us of the privilege that is our work. That people trust us in their darkest, deepest, most frightened moments to care for them and to care for their loved ones. And this profound privilege is what fills me with so much gratitude every day. In what other profession is work so rich and meaningful? Each day we all have an immeasurable purpose. So as you go into your residency, which will be hard, I want you to remember, no matter your hours worked, no matter your challenges, no matter your sacrifice, I want you to remember your privilege, your purpose, and the immense fulfillment and gratitude that that brings. Because your patients need you. The world needs you. We, all of us in this room, need you. We need your kindness, love, and compassion when we are going through the worst of times. We need your patience and partnership as we share with you our darkest fears. We need your research and innovation so that patients like my best friend's dad can be diagnosed and treated successfully. We need you to teach the next generation of physicians and we need your leadership as you bring us into the next generation of healthcare. Class of 2019, it has been an immense privilege to serve alongside you these past years, and for that, I am exceptionally grateful. You are all incredible, and I am sure will do amazing things in your lives. I and everyone here feel blessed have been a small part of your incredible journey. Class of 2019, congratulations. Doctors, your patients need you. Thank you, Dr. Cronin. Um, at this time, I would like to direct your attention to the commencement program. Over the course of the last few weeks, we have had the opportunity to recognize achievements at many events, 
including at uh, this, uh, this afternoon's awards banquet. I would now ask that all students uh, in the graduating class who have been presented with awards, please stand to be recognized, everyone who's received an award. And please stay standing, all of you with your cords, everyone who's had an award. Some of the awards are designated um, by cords, and the color of the cord represents a specific award. Those students who have been awarded the distinction in research are noted with white cords. Distinction in service is noted by the royal blue cords. Distinction in medical education is noted by the light blue cords. Those elected to the Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Medical Society are wearing the green and gold cords. Those elected to the Gold Humanism Honor Society are wearing the black and gold cords. And the Distinction Award, which is given to the top 10% of the class of 2019, is noted by the gold cords. Congratulations to all of you. For now, I would just like to ask Daniel Soon Kim and Joseph Lindsay to continue standing. Daniel and Joseph are the recipients of the Dean's Award for Research Excellence. This award is given by the faculty to those students who have made outstanding research contributions during their medical school career. Thank you. Now I would like to ask the following students to stand. Jacob Cederbaum, Linz Franco, Alexander Yemas, Raul um, Aigar, and Daniel Nelson. These students are the top five graduates who have excelled academically throughout their medical school, uh, school education. Congratulations. <laughs> And will Linz Franco please remain standing? The highest academic achievement award upon the recommendation of the medical school faculty is given to the graduating senior who has attained the highest record of academic achievement throughout medical school. This year's recipient is Linz Franco, who will be pursuing a general surgery residency at Massachusetts General Hospital. Congratulations, Linz. <laughs> Upon the recommendation of the faculty of the University of Michigan Medical School, in the regents of the university confer the degree Doctor of Medicine upon those so recommended. I now have the privilege of conferring to you the diploma certifying the degree Doctor of Medicine. I would like to now ask Dr. Rajesh Mangalkar, Associate Dean for Medical Student Education, to come forward and present this year's graduating seniors. Dean Rungi, it is my great honor to present to you the University of Michigan Medical School's 169th class, the class of 2019. <laughs> Dr. Mariam Ziad Abdulghani. Dr. Tessa Ajamavich. Dr. Lauren Layla Agobi. Dr. Neil Christopher Alatar.
Dr. Hassan M. Ali. Dr. Genevieve Allen. Dr. Jennifer Nicole Angel. Dr. Alexis Gabriela Antunes. Dr. Ali Azgar Hashim Arastu. Dr. Mariam Kamel Ayash. Dr. Philip Laib Azuz. Dr. Ali Hussein Basharush. Dr. Sarah Diane Banks. Dr. Courtney Barbica. Dr. Andrew J. Beach. Dr. Sydney Elizabeth Behrman. Dr. Natalie Zeal Bishusher. Dr. Charlotte Bordillon. Dr. Julia Ruth Brennan. Dr. Jonathan Michael Brown. Dr. Owen Harris Brown. Dr. Christina Elena Caprizioso. Dr. Jacob Cedarbaum. Dr. Robert J. Cesaro. Dr. Mayuri Chandran. Dr. Yamin Chen. Dr. Catherine Chilton. Dr. Hannah Rose Cottrell. Dr. Nicole Marissa Kramer. Dr. Kristen Elizabeth Cross. Dr. Adam James Cruz. Dr. Christina Marie De Benedictus. Dr. Stephanie Asia Deboli. Dr. Sagar Satish Deshpande. Dr. Isidore Dodard Friedman. Dr. Anthony Duncan. Dr. 
Dr. Maya Noel Faison. Dr. Ilana Paula Fisher. Dr. Emily Nicole Flagler. Dr. Charles Ross Frank. Dr. Linz Franco. Dr. Nasia Frataroli. Dr. Benjamin Freilich. Dr. Brian Fry. Dr. Emily N. Gearlings. Dr. Catherine Michelle Gilbert. Dr. Rachel Aaron Goodman. Dr. Aaron Margaret Gray. Dr. Rebecca Clara Grossman Kahn. Dr. Mary L. Guan. Dr. Vinay Chetan Gudaguntla. Dr. Rahel Rohini Gupta. Dr. Rachel Goodfriend. Dr. Carly Linnea Haug. Dr. Gerard Edward Heath. Dr. Sean Thomas Heward. Dr. Alexander Joseph Yelmas. Dr. Michael Henry Ho. Dr. Connor William Hoban. Dr. Timothy Charles Hoffman. Dr. Emily Margaret Hogekian. Dr. Ryan C. Hogmood. Dr. Michael Inadomi. Dr. Hillary Rose Iskin. Dr. Rahul Iyengar. Dr. Nina Ramesh Ayer. Dr. Jasmine Amanda Jackson. Dr. Christina Lee James. Dr. 
Dr. Rana Ahmad Kabir. Dr. Lakshmi Karra. Dr. Grace Catherine Keeney Bonthrone. Dr. Tobias Philip Keeney Bonthrone. Dr. Eric J. Kurgis. Dr. Daniel Sung Kim. Dr. Daniel Clark. Dr. Jean Marie Kachkoden. Dr. Christy Key. Dr. Joseph Larson. Dr. Jean Lee. Dr. Kelsey Marie Lemon. Dr. Patrick Lee. Dr. Joseph Rayner Lindsay. Dr. Jerry Liu. Dr. Joyce Lowe. Dr. Connor Lucas Roberts. Dr. Lisa Lee. Dr. Colleen Antoinette Mackey. Dr. Marissa Faith Martin. Dr. Andrea Joan Matthew. Dr. Lauren Elizabeth Mers. Dr. Jessa Elaine Miller. Dr. John Michael Muller. Dr. Michelle Danae Monk. Dr. Jeffrey Lee Nadell. Dr. Novis Behajet Naum. Dr. Daniel Brent Nelson. Dr. Jennifer Aaron Neva. Dr. Rebecca Tu Yen Wen. Dr. Susan Elizabeth Norse. Dr. 
Dr. Kelsey Elizabeth Oatman. Dr. Nketchen Yellum Q. Ogu. Dr. Patrick John O'Hare. Dr. Uchenna Okoro. Dr. Amro Omari. Dr. Kemi A. Omotoso. Dr. Anne Marie Elizabeth Opapari. Dr. Norman A. Orabi. Dr. Eddie Pantsloff. Dr. Adish Parikh. Dr. Hillary Paulson. Dr. Lauren J. Phillips. Dr. Rebecca Pilkerton. Dr. C. Du Plummer. Dr. Kaustab Prabhu. Dr. Nima Brandon Razavian. Dr. Alexandra Lee Rittering. Dr. Nathan Taylor Rietberg. Dr. Natalia Rosculet. Dr. Crystal Wan Cheng Rui. Dr. Alexandra Kinga Zapetsky. Dr. Mohammed Amr Sabah. Dr. Salome Michelle Salari. Dr. Anjali Lee Saripali. Dr. Gabriella Sousa. Dr. Angeline Mary Sawaya. Dr. Andrew Michael Schuler. Dr. Shana Sakri. Dr. Daniel Zaidan Saman. Dr. Jonathan Philip Silverberg. Dr. 
Dr. Harkamal Singh. Dr. Josiah David Smiley. Dr. Rebecca Lee Wang Smiley. Dr. Chelsea Morrow Smith. Dr. Joshua Smith. Dr. Max Daniel Sokoloff. Dr. Ann A. Solomon. Dr. Dr. Sudarshan Srivatsan. Dr. Stephanie Stallard. Dr. Raymond John Strobel. Dr. William Sturdevant. Dr. Jennifer Karen Sun. Dr. Julianne Chapansky. Dr. Owen A. Thompson. Dr. Wala Walid Tout. Dr. Catherine Eve Vogt. Dr. Jacqueline Barber Walker. Dr. Brian Wyland. Dr. Natasha Elise Weiser. Dr. Morgan Stewart White. Dr. Gregory Thomas Woods. Dr. Shinrong Julia Wu. Dr. E. Jung Yang. Dr. Megan Yannick. Dr. Niyusha Yousefi. Dr. Megan Catherine Zakurski. Dr. Alexander Robert Zeitlin. Dr. Catherine Rose Zorales. Dean Rungi, 
I present to you the class of 2019. Congratulations. In our profession, <clears throat> it is the custom established more than 2,000 years ago that no one may be admitted to its honor who has not first expressly taken upon him or herself its obligations. On behalf of our elders, I call upon you to take, as we have taken before you, the oath, which bears the name of Hippocrates. Will the candidates for the degree of Doctor of Medicine in the class of 2019 please rise? I would also like to invite all those physicians in the audience who wish at this time to renew the Hippocratic Oath to rise and join with the candidates in taking the oath. The language in which our predecessors first pronounced these words are no longer, is no longer spoken. The very gods upon whom they called to witness have been discarded, but still we find no nobler terms than the most ancient in which were handed down in the tradition of our calling. Will you please repeat after me? I do solemnly swear that which I take most sacred. I do solemnly swear that which I take most sacred. That I will be loyal to the profession of medicine and just and generous to its members. that I will share the knowledge and skills which I have received with my colleagues and with future generations of physicians. That I will lead my life and practice my art in uprightness, uprightness and honor. That into whatsoever house I shall enter, it shall be for the good of the sick to the utmost of my powers. I, holding myself aloof from wrong, from corruption, from the tempting of others to vice, That I will exercise my art solely for the good of my patients. And will give no drug, perform no operation for a criminal purpose, even if solicited, far less suggested. That whatsoever I shall hear, see, or hear of the lives of patients which is not fitting to be spoken, I will keep inviolably secret. These things I do promise, and in proportion as I am faithful to this oath, may happiness and good repute be ever mine, the opposite if I shall be forsworn. I now invite all those that are able, please rise and join me in singing the alma mater of the University of Michigan, the yellow and blue, followed by the greatest college fight song ever written, The Victors. The words to both of these songs can be found on the back of your program.
As we conclude this celebration, we would like to extend an invitation to family and friends to join us at a reception honoring our amazing graduates at the Michigan League. For now, we ask that you please remain seated, or seat, uh, become seated, until all faculty and graduates have exited. Once again, on behalf of the faculty of the University of Michigan Medical School, congratulations to the class of 2019. Woo!